does real Asian mean to you? Community that allows Asian creatives to gather together. This is the place where things will happen. It shines a light on a usually forgotten community. Welcome to Real Ideas, a series of industry and film conversations from the Toronto Real Asian International Film Festival. I'm Samir. I'm the industry and education programmer. We're here with Kara, Angelica, and Leah. We're recording live at the Real Asian Film Festival, where we're hosting this intel sorry this incredible group of writers and artists. We're so happy to have you here, and welcome to Real Asian. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to say that Real Asian is committed to more abundance and complexity in Asian and Asian diasporic film and media arts. However, while we reckon with our complicated histories of cultural or linguistic displacement, it is important for us to acknowledge the ways we ourselves uh, as settlers have benefited from the Canadian government's displacement of Indigenous peoples. At Real Asian, we reckon openly with our responsibility to this land and its caretakers. We recognize that we are still in a time of great upheaval and need, that the dispossession of Indigenous communities and loss of their language and culture is not a thing of the past, but it's ongoing. We honor the long-standing work of organizers, creatives, and communities that continue to give us hope, language, and possibility, and work toward critical and reflexive allyship with Indigenous peoples everywhere, exercising their sovereignty and working towards justice and freedom. Relations offices and activities are located on the treaty territory uh, of the Mississaugas of the Credit, the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat Nations. This territory is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Covenant, a treaty of collective responsibility for the protection and sharing of land, water, and resources. We're here in our beautiful office, a space that we share with like-minded community organizers, such as Imaginative, and we feel so much privilege in sharing a space with organizations that develop and nurture the voices of their communities. Um, and we're so proud to have you all here as well. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to say that Real Asian uh, wants to thank its public funders. This includes Telefilm Canada, Canada Council for the Arts, the Province of Ontario, Ontario Arts Council, Toronto Arts Council, Ontario Trillium Foundation, Ontario Creates, and Ontario Cultural Attractions Fund. This panel is presented with the support of CBC, Canada Media Fund, and Writers Guild of Canada. We'd also like to thank uh, the rest of our Real Ideas sponsors, Crave, Warner Brothers, and Discovery Access Canada. And finally, a big thank you to our community supporter, BIPOC TV and Film. We're always eager to hear from our community. Uh, please scan the QR code or uh, look at the link uh, in your chat and let us know your thoughts on this panel. Uh, to get started, I'd like to introduce our three fantastic panelists and TV writers. Uh, we have Angelica right over here, a TV writer based in Toronto, Canada. She draws on her experience growing up in a remote village in the Philippines and her subsequent immigration to Toronto to write stories about family, new identities, and ambition. Angelica is a writer and executive story editor on season three of Run the Burbs. In the past, she's written on Moonshine, Overlord, and The Underwoods, and Top Line. Angelica is currently in development on a half-hour comedy with Marble Media and a uh, YA series with Nine Story. We also have Leia right over here. 
Uh, Leah is a Franco-Quebecois Filipino-Caucasian writer director raised in a small town near Montreal. Before working in television, Leah was a stage actor, then moved into writing and directing short films. They've been selected to many competitive programs with BIPOC TV and film, um, WIDC, Netflix, Real World, and many more. Leah also earned a WGC Award nomination for their work on the Peabody Award-winning series, Sword Off. Leah's thrilled to take part in this year's Real Asian International Film Festival. We also have Kara right here to my right. Kara is a two-time Canadian Screen Award nominee for her work as a writer, producer, and host for TVO Kids, The Space. Kara's written for children's shows such as Dino Dana and It's My Party. Kara's feature directorial debut, a thriller titled Dying for Admission, will be released later in 2023, so watch out. And Kara is currently showrunning Auntie B's House, a preschool sitcom for CBC Kids about the foster care system here in Canada. To begin, I'd like to take a. I'd like to ask you guys: uh, Can you share a memorable moment or experience from your early writing career, such as your first writing job, or the story that inspired you to become a writer? Anyone uh, can t start. Anyone in particular? <laughs> Katie did it. I go. Yeah, I go. Um, I'm not sure what inspired me to be a writer. I think I was one of those kids who just knew I was going to be in entertainment in some. So I kind of always, that was always on the, on the docket for me. Uh, but I think my memorable first, one of my memorable first experiences in scripted was uh, being tricked into working without being paid. Mm. I think it's one we all have, unfortunately. Um, so uh, beware. <laughs> young folks um i think it's something that that happens to all of us and it did happen to me when i first got here. i was so i felt so lucky i felt so um you know privileged to to be asked to uh, to help you know develop this uh story and you know help create the bible and do all that stuff and i didn't know enough to know that that you know money should have come to me for that and it took that hard lesson um but it didn't deter me i just learned not to go back to that particular <laughs> <laughs> that particular place of employ and um, and move from there but um, I think that really taught me a bit of a rough lesson to begin with and it also showed me that that didn't deter me about writing and about participating in that in that world of creating a story just you know be judicious and come in clear-eyed about who you're working with and how they treat you yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think my me memorable one was definitely working on Top Line. Um, it was just so, I remember I, I, I got the package for it and I was just so moved by the project and felt so seen by the project and the characters. Um, and I just related so much to the lead. Um, and so I, I just loved working on that show and um, it felt like the writer the writing room was so awesome and Romeo Candido is an incredible, incredible creative force and just so open and so kind. Um, and I think it gave me uh, like, a, like a benchmark for how um, I would like to feel in a writer's room. So I think that was kind of the real gift of that experience was mm. that it's like, I know, you know, you can be on other shows and it can be tough, but I know that like there, there will be shows where it's going to be awesome and it's going to great be great and feel great because I've already felt that. So it was like it was a really gr great way to kind of like set the tone. That's really nice. I know. <laughs> That's nicer than mine. That's really nice. <laughs> no, here, I'll come in with a okay. uh, <laughs> sandwich. Uh, right. No, but th I think we've already been trauma bonding talking. <laughs> and so I would say um, what inspired me to be a writer and now I'm directing is uh, years of people basically being like, you can't do it. <laughs> because yep. uh, that's part, like, part of it, especially when I came up, it was pe putting people under your thumb to, like, teach them the rules of the room, etc. cetera. Um, but it was kind of, like, overcoming that. And then I, that feeling you get when you click on an idea or an outline that you're like, oh, that's the story. I feel like that feeling is kind of addictive. So, mm -hmm. yeah. But I also, I've been in rooms where I'm like, oh, i got to quit this industry. <laughs> <laughs> and I've been in rooms where it's like, oh, this is how it should be. This yeah. is love. This yeah. is it. So yeah. This, is this is warmth. Yeah. 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 This is what it feels like to be treated well. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. 
Um, Angelica, you did mention Top Line, so I'd love to start off with this. So you wrote the third episode, which is my favorite episode on Top Line. Um, there's a line that struck me, and the line is, Mom left the blueprint, and we can't mess it up. So when you were younger, growing up in a remote village in the Philippines, did you know you wanted to write for television? What was your original blueprint, and how did it change when screenwriting entered your life? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I always wanted to write. I, always, I grew up watching telenovelas. Um, and once I, fi I think once I figured out that, like, that's a job, <laughs> I, was like, <laughs> I was like, let's go. Let's do it. Let's do it. So I, I knew I always wanted to write. Like, e like, from a very young age, I knew I wanted to write. And I knew, like, I, I knew, like, what school I wanted to go. Like, I, I had, like, a plan. Um, but I think once I got out of school, once I... Obviously, w once I moved here, w I think once I moved here, like things kind of opened up a little bit. That it's like, oh, like that's a viable um, career. Because I think back home, I, I mean, I was a kid when I moved here, but back home, I, d I didn't think that it was like absolutely 100% possible. Like it felt like maybe I go for, I go to school for something else, and then like I'll find my place um, in this career. Uh, but when I moved here, I was like. Oh, like it just felt like there was more opportunity, more, um, more of a path uh, for like a career in the arts, and so that was um, that was kind of how that changed. I think um, I think what has changed from the blueprint was um, like I think after like I graduated from school, like the actual like how to get a job in the industry, there is no blueprint. Um, yep. You know, everybody has their own path. Um, and I think that changed and like I think for me being like the, the, the benchmarks I had in my head of like hey I want to be at this point of my career when I'm at this age <laughs> I know <laughs> it's so funny it's so funny now but I think those things changed as I like um, had more experience in the industry and I think like as a person just like living life more that you're like oh hey like this dream isn't like everything you know you can, should have a life <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Key phrase. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. have a life. I think writers out there should know that. Enjoy your personal yeah, lives life. as well. It's very important, and it <laughs> will help your uh, writing as well. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I want to stress that. It's like don't believe the hype. I mean, there's got the, this whole industry will pressure you and gaslight you into thinking that that your commitment isn't good enough if you don't give everything and then some mm. and all of your time and all of your money and all of your experiences yeah. dedicated to this thing. And um, listen, I won't say that's true or not true, but you have to come in knowing that these are the years and days of your life and they will go by and you should spend them with some level of enjoyment. So I, I always try to, uh, at least every year or six months, I check in with myself about this career and the, the my daily life. Like, do, am I enjoying my daily right now? Or is this making me miserable? What is it? And it's okay to pivot, to, to take some time away, to do it, be less intense about it. You know, yeah. it will replenish you. It'll keep you <laughs> interesting and interested. Um, yeah, definitely put, put stock in your other passions. Everything that makes your whole human yep. being is important. I also felt much more empowered when I, when I thought, I could walk away from this career yes. <laughs> and I'd be fine, which sounds insane that that would give me comfort, but that was taking away power from this, you're, you know, you're so lucky. You're so lucky to be executive producing a show and breaking your back and bleeding for this show. <laughs> oh my gosh, I'm so lucky. I am lucky, mm -hmm. but I'm also, it's a job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm coming in for a job and we make this our whole lives, but you're right, like the, the travel or the having a life, having friends, having family, having experiences is actually what's gonna make your writing all the more better. Yeah. Because you have stuff to write from. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And don't break your back for TV writing. Oh it's God. the best. I love it. Yeah. I love don't television. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, it's great spending a room, a time in a room with people or, you know, a dark room on your own, but get some sun, yeah. make some memories. Yeah. Ill will translate into your script. Yeah. Uh, and for Leia and for Kara, for Kara, for both of you, was there any hesitancy from yourselves, from your families to even embark in a career in the arts? Uh, for many of us in the industry, we know how hard it is to break in. And for the people outside the industry, TV writing is kind of mysterious. Mm -hmm. What were kind of the hesitancy that you had before going into it? Uh, if any. Well, having immigrant parents, you're always, that's why when Angelica was like, 
well, yeah, I just thought, you know, I'd do a different career and then find my yeah. other path. I said, the South Asian way um, is to be <laughs> like, well, I have to. And the other thing is, is that having a good side hustle, but also not breaking your back and giving it everything means that you can have a bit more of a life. So, like, I know some people that are like, no, you have to give it everything. And it's like, you also have to make money and have a life. Mm-hmm. And like, but I feel like when you come from this background, uh, a lot of the time, your parents are hesitant because they you they want you to get a solid job and this is not necessarily you have to figure out how to find your solid ground within the career whether that's making money on the side whether that's diversifying within the actual industry as well i just think it's important to be able to feed your family yeah yeah i, I agree. agree i agree <laughs> i would say on my end um i don't know that my parents know what i do <laughs> With my time to this day, I'm not sure that they know what I've been up to. <laughs> if they think it's marketing or something um, like that, they have other stuff to do. I don't know, you know. But um, uh, so, if anyone wants to give me career advice or uh, let, me, or also financial advice, I could really use that kind of parenting. Um, but yeah, otherwise, no. I would. I my experience with my particular parents was very much uninvolved in that like so I don't know that I had I didn't have resistance or encouragement really I didn't have it wasn't I wasn't being dissuaded but I also wasn't being like you know like this is great right (laughs) so I think it was a bit of like let's wait and see and now it's been many years I have the opposite I have like a tiger dad that was just on my no back the whole still yeah still (laughs) and I, I like a lot of you know uh, that uh, immigrant parents kind of have that reputation of being like they've had a plan for you yeah um, and I just I, I, I didn't particularly have that uh, that experience but it's um, yeah it's, I guess it's, it's different for everybody my, like my my mom's Filipino my dad's white and I uh, for my mom I think that's where I maybe expected more uh, resistance if only because my dad was an actor he was in that mm. world uh, so uh, to him maybe he like saw it more as a following the footsteps type of thing um but i think to like uh to my mom's credit it she's a she's a nurse and she didn't say a peep you know i think i I think it it wouldn't have made sense she saw who i was right from when i was a kid so i don't think it would have made any sense and she's too logical and too smart to know that like it would have and my personality would not have it. Um, so I know that she she probably knew it didn't make any sense, but she also didn't have an artistic, um, I think, like uh, upbringing or history. So she also didn't have, you know, the, the kind of uh, advice to give or, you know, the, you know, gui- guidance that could have been offered in there. So it was, it was a different kind of guidance, but not necessarily active in the, in, in like, like verbally expressing how they felt about the profession I chose. I mean, my, my, my dad, like, had a career change at the time that I was pursuing, like, started to pursue this career. This is incredible. And so I think he, like, just understood what it meant to, like, go for something. Um, and so he was, like, super supportive. Um, wow. And it's, I know, I, I, I always feel, like, I always feel so weird sharing this story because I feel like it's, it's great to <laughs> hear that they're not, like, all immigrant yeah. parents aren't the same. <laughs> yeah, no, my, pa- well, like, it's, inter- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, so he was, like, extremely supportive, and because he was so supportive, everybody, I mean, I think my siblings were also supportive in general, um, but because my dad was so supportive, it, like, kind of kept everybody, like, s- like, you know, to do the same. Yeah. Um, and so I'm, I'm always so uh, thankful for that. But I mean, my first, the first career I wanted was like to be a singer songwriter. And I wrote, <laughs> I, I want to hear these songs. Yes. No, I can't. No, 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 no. Um, Here today. No. Drop no. the EP right <laughs> now. No. Sing, no, sing. I, I wanted to be a singer songwriter. And I, and I wrote, I wanted to go to this art school. And I wrote this letter to my parents. And I was like, please, like, let me like audition for the school, blah, blah, blah. And I, and my dad didn't want to break my heart, so he gave it to my mom to deal with. And, <laughs> and then they were both the just like, they were both just like, hey, just go, like, we love that you're, like, into this, um, but you're very young. Like, go to a regular school, like, have a normal teenage life, and if you want to pursue this after, go for it. Like, absolutely go for it. But right now, like, you know, like, don't tie yourself to one thing and, like, have that be 
everything in your life. And and I was like, but I like didn't listen to it. I was like, I had never thrown a tantrum, but I think I, I'm, yeah, I <laughs> threw a tantrum. And I was like, this is my reasoning. I was like, but mom, who will write Beyonce songs? <laughs> Somebody needs to. Yeah, that's literally what I said. <laughs> that's still. literally what I said. I was I like, somebody that. has to. And she just like kind of <laughs> laughed. Like it like just cut. It cut the tension in the room so quickly. Oh my God. And then yeah, but I think generally my parents have been supportive. So it's been there have been moments of like doubt yeah. for sure because they just want me to you know have a good life, like <laughs> be able to pay for like my needs. Uh, but other than that, I think they've been pretty supportive. Yeah. That's really great. Angelica, Beyonce's album for me didn't hit as well the last album, oh so you really need no. to get in contact. Oh no. Can you no imagine I'm what Renaissance oh would no. be? Yeah, oh no. yeah I don't know. No, good. Beyonce, huge fan. Uh, <laughs> imagine. She's like no. severe right. Yeah, I'm I'm be- beehives, yeah. beehives coming for you. Beehives coming for you. Um, and Leah, I absolutely love the TV series, sort of, and you're writing on uh, the series as well. And you wrote one of my, f- uh, you co-wrote one of my favorite episodes with Kaya Green, uh, called "Sort of Amsterdam." Before you start writing on the show, sort of, uh, you wrote a sample script that made its way to uh, the show creators Bilal and Fab. How did your sample reach them, and what was it about your sample um, that made them know they can trust in you to have? to represent their show, to represent their characters, their show sensibility, and their show's DNA. Was this something about yourself as well that they maybe saw that would be great uh, to represent the lead character's uh, life? I will never know. Um, you'd have to crawl into their brains. I would. I don't know. Um, but uh, so essentially how the, how the script got to them is uh, it was a sample of one of my personal hmm. crazy weird little story ideas. I write pretty weird stuff. I was write it the one in space? I write genre. No. It's oh. a, it's a different genre. One. We'll talk about it. Aww. Oh. It's I great. It's that. really funny. Um, yeah, no, I wrote a different one that was a, a more fantasy genre. And um, uh, it got to fab in kind of, it's, it's super boring, but it's a combination of just luck and being ready with the material and doing the thing that I always did, which is try to expand my network and try to expand my connections and, and meetings in, in this industry. So through doing that and keeping that as part of my daily MO is reaching out to people and uh, and you know checking in on what they're doing and introducing myself and doing all of that. I did that with Fab. So with Fab, we met initially on a development room on a different show. And it was, uh, it was a really nice room. It was one of those where um, we all got to know each other quite well. The, the topic was personal so we got personal and through just a few days together I, it felt like we had kind of bonded all of us so um, it was a it was a great experience and uh, after that I knew that Fab had done Save Me and I loved Save Me. I thought Save Me was the only thing I really saw that had the, the tone I, w- I wanted to strike which was something that really towed the line between this dark comedy it's like really funny has some really strong laugh beats in it but it was still still it's is drama there's still something in there that's quite dramatic so it was what i wanted so i knew that i wanted that to be my life um so i went into that room and this was the cut and i had coffee and asked him to read did all the stuff that honestly i would just do with anyone whom i admired as an actor um and he just sat there and read it and he just sat there and read it and he just said okay and it just so happens to have hit the list with fab and fab has this sort of does my sense of humor and my sort of uh, god depth sounds horrible but like it's my it's a, it's a bit of a, a tragic sense of humor I guess maybe um, and um, and he's the one who sent it to Bilal and they seem to enjoy it as well I didn't know Bilal before so I was so happy that that went well but on top of that and this like again portion of luck um, I went to a cafe maybe a couple of weeks after Fab had read my stuff. A cafe I've like probably never been to before or since, but I bumped into an old friend, Laura Perlmutter. And Laura is someone I know from Montreal. I didn't know back when. And Laura happened to be a producer on Sort Of, which was at that point getting talked about, getting you know created, getting in the inception was happening. So I happened to exist at the right place at the right time, getting to know the right people when you know the action was beginning on this show. So there's to me there's always like if you're talking about any 
portion of success in this industry, you have to talk about luck. You have to talk about, it's not talent, <laughs> listen, it's some talent, but it's also right place, right time. And you just happen to have the talent to back it up once you're at the right place, the right time. So, but I feel like you, what the story you're telling, you orchestrated that luck as well, right? Fab, I did. Laura, not so much. Um, but uh, Fair. Yeah. yeah. But because Laura, I don't know, like now, now, you know, Fab and Laura were having meetings, and it was like, oh wait, I just saw Leia, la la la. And, uh, you know, all of a sudden, I'm in, I'm in the mind, you know, of, of these mm-hmm. two. Mm-hmm. So for me, s- the lesson for me, and what I always try to do is like just remind people you're alive. That's all. Remind them you're still here. You're still. Remind them what you're after. Clearly, mm-hmm. what sh- what you need from them if they should come across that opportunity, uh, and just remind them you're still living. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. So so yeah. So that sample got to to them, and I guess they saw something in there that would help the the tone. To me, what really fostered the tone was that that was my statement. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, and Kara, for you, so I, if people don't know out there, because a lot of them they know, Kara was actually my mentor for a kids writing boot camp hosted by BIPOC TV and film. Yay. It was an incredible experience. Um, you were such an amazing mentor. Mm-hmm. It led me to getting my first job in a development TV writing room, um, which was lovely, and I did get paid for it, which was even more amazing. lovely for it. <laughs> um, yes. But Kara, I was really curious, when you were coming into the industry, did you have any mentorship? Did you go through any training programs? How did you break into kids TV writing? Actually, I did. Um, I did a program um, <laughs> when the term BIPOC was starting to get popular. Um, <laughs> 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 you remember that time, both of you. Uh, Sinking Ship um, did this program. And so that was my first script, um, was with them for Dino Dana. And then because I had connections at TVO, it's all about like using what you have. And so I used those connections. I reminded people, we went, my writing partner and I went out on generals, and um, it's just like a, I think it's the consistency that really um, put me out there, and willingness to work on just about any (laughs) 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 You know, (laughs) they're laughing because they're like, oh yes, hire, guns for hire. Yes. Um, So that's how I, I broke in because I was a host, and as an actor, and then I was just like, "Mm, I think I could do what they're doing. So then I went and did that because, yep. Yeah, so that's <laughs> what you wanted to do. I guess. <laughs> I just sort of fell into it. No, I'm decent. Okay, cool. Mm-hmm. And Angelica, you have an interesting pathway into TV writing as well. Um, we have another connection. I was an intern at a company called Bo Rocker Media. They uh, make scripted content, shows like Orphan Black, Being Erica. When I started, um, I heard amazing reviews about the previous <laughs> intern. Who was you? <laughs> what was your experience like working in TV development, and how did that kind of shape your writing? In sorry, how did that shape your writing, and also uh, your work in writing and getting jobs? Yeah. Um, so that opportunity, um, like I, I think I found it on Indeed, <laughs> and I was Whoa. like, and I think I w- at that point in my life I was just applying to anything and everything, and um, maybe like the year before that I got into the band f- um, the Varsity of Voices program. Um, oh wait, no, 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 it was, a, it, was a different pro- it was a different program, but it was at Banff, and I didn't know what to do, and so I just took a bunch, like I just did all these speed round meetings with people, like the most random people, and I met this guy, and he is a producer, and I was like, hey, like I'm a new grad, like any advice on like how to get a start? And he was like, go work at a production company, go look at the budgets and <laughs> learn how learn how sh- how things get funded um what things get made um and he's like that would ha- that that's going to help you a lot um in like you know finding your voice breaking in blah 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 so that's what i did i <laughs> i somehow got in into that um into that company and i was there for like 8 months and i read everything that wow. came through the door um, I looked at budgets, I looked at all the stuff, um, and I just soaked up every piece of knowledge that I could get. I, and I kept telling people I was like that I wanted to write. I was like, like I told them, I showed them how passionate I was about story and TV, um, and I kept telling people I wanted to write. And so by the time, 
my con they kept extending my contract and then I think they were told they can't extend it anymore because they have to like either give me a job or like let me go. <laughs> um, there's rules around there's that. Rules around that. Really? There's rules around that. Really? Um, but at, at that time then they were, they w Orphan Black was ending and then they had a project that was kind of like, oh, let's explore what other shows could be set in the Orphan Black world. And I had read all the scripts that came in from all the writers. Look at um, you. Uh, and yeah, so, and so, um, and I kept telling them, I was like, I want to write, I want to write. And so one of my bosses was like, hey, you take really great notes. Like you've taken really great notes in all of our meetings. Like, why don't you come be the writer's assistant? Like, is, like would you want to do that? And I remember, I was like, yes, because I remember I kept reading other people. Like I was reading people that they were trying to hire for assistance. And I was like, God, I, I, like, I really just want to do this. Like, why can't I just do this? And I remember just like having that thought in my head. <laughs> and so when she asked if, if I wanted to do it, I was like, yes, of course, duh. Um, and yeah, and that's kind of how I got into TV. But that's also, speaking on that, like uh, three years ago, I wasn't, I wasn't directing, but I had the skill. And then I started to, I was like, you know what? I'm, I decided, I was like, I'm going to start directing more mm -hmm. because mm. the industry is tough. And then I told everybody that I was directing again. Yep. Yeah. And all of a sudden, like, I think just putting it out there because people are busy and then they're like, yeah. sorry, Angelica, you said you wanted to be a writer 25 times to me, right? You'd do it once a day, right? Am I just making <laughs> that up? Yeah. Because I remember, and it's vague, they remember, and you're like, yes, I tell you every day when we're in the bathroom washing yeah. our hands. Yeah. So I think that's what Yeah, I think, honestly, telling people, like, what you want to do is... Like it, they, the, and then they'll connect you to people yes. who can maybe yes. help you. Like it's all, it's all part of the kind of the hustle of it. Hundred percent. That's exactly the same thing for me. I was just like directing. Let's do it. And then I just reached out to every single person I know and be like, I'm directing. Hello, <laughs> you know. So like, yes. and and eventually a call came back. You know, and it was like one out of twenty five. You know, you have to just. It, to me, it's really a numbers game. Mm -hmm. But like, just keep. Yeah. Well, I was out here fishing. Just truly, fish. truly, <laughs> I, it's there's to me there's no other way. Like yeah. you know, I'm I'm not represented, so I'm working on my own. So I'm really like, wow. yeah. If you want to represent a weirdo writer, uh, hello. <laughs> but um, it's yeah. For me, the the market, the Canadian market, just hasn't been uh for the kind of stuff that I write for my totally. originals. So it's been difficult for me, and I can't blame agents to not want to rep someone who's. Uh, scripts they don't really know where they're going to land here um, so it's it's a complicated sort of give and take in terms of being uh, authentic to myself as, as my voice and then the choice to write what is really more practical or in demand or safer to write or has more opportunity to be sold here in Canada um, anyway what was I talking about it was different um, but yeah to uh, talk about about yourself like be super super clear as to what you want is be prepared. I was talking about this with another another writer as well. It was just like, if you show up to a meeting, you'll be surprised. Everybody wants to help you. Mm -hmm. If they're mm. taking a meeting with you, if they're having coffee with you, they're dedicating that time, they want to h actively help you, and they want to know what you need. Put it out there, say it clearly, um, and be specific, and that person, like ma tailor it to the person you're speaking to and how they can particularly help you. If they're like, they yes. produce horror, mm -hmm. then don't talk to them about kids' shows, you yes. know? Like, tell them what, what you want in the horror space. Uh, tailor it, but be clear, and people will think of you and just keep coming back. Take notes. Take notes as to what you said to that person. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and That's what and I don't follow do. yes. up. Yeah, yeah. I always, if I talk to someone, put it in your calendar. The follow-up is booked already. I know when I'm going to be talking to that person again. So make it part of your daily, it's part of your job, you know, mm -hmm. to interact that way. Yeah, definitely. Um, okay, so I'd love to take a moment to also explore the different roles each of you have taken uh, in the TV world and how that kind of shaped your writing career, but also uh, like your career moving forward. So Kara, developer, writer, director, showrunner, executive producer, yeah, <laughs> like snap <laughs> for it, on Auntie B's house. Huge congrats, amazing show. Your neck must be, you know, the strongest neck muscles in the <laughs> world. You're wearing so many hats. Can you talk to us about shaping uh, the series, which is about Auntie B and her foster children, where they use laughter, music, and play um, to navigate the ups, the downs, and the merry-go-rounds of foster life. How was it shaping such an incredible series and working with children? Um, so it was awesome. Uh, it was like a, actually like a really good development process um, because the executive producers that I worked with, they knew what they wanted, um, which is kind of rare sometimes. So I had been lucky enough to, with my writing partner, Cheryl Meyer, like develop a couple of kids shows and, and other types, like we developed a bunch of our own work. So through that 
like self development of the work, I understood what I kind of needed to do. Right. And then we wrote a couple scripts in the fall. We got greenlit, and then we went to camera in spring. So it was a very, very fast process. Khalil Brooks is amazing. She's the lead. She was in the t- foster care system for 20 years and had a very good experience with the foster mom. So she wanted to explore that, and she had done a musical theater character called Auntie B and, and did, like, um, school shows and library shows and whatnot with puppets. And so we took it from that idea and then we went what if we put the skin of like a 90s sitcom on it and so we did that and then we added music and it was seven minutes so it was a lot like it really taught me a lot about storytelling but it's funny because when you're like how was the development process i don't know man every day i was like what am i doing what are we doing like is this good like and sometimes you know you're like I, I feel my instincts and my gut is saying that this is the way to go. But in development, sometimes it's like, oh, sorry, we wanted fuchsia, not purple. And you're like, well, okay, it's kind of in the same color family. No, it's not, you know? <laughs> mm. So it's just, it's a, it can be a very frustrating process. But I think putting on the hat of like, what am I learning here? Who is the audience? Who am I doing this for? I had to keep two executive producers, plus Kalela as an executive producer, plus network executives, like some a lot of the time when you're the showrunner you're the creator i'm the developer tv person not the actual creator of the show um even though i had a big part of that uh, but it's so it was it was different than just being like this is completely my vision this is completely my vision sorry my technique i used to be a singer <laughs> as well so <laughs> that's pathetic i'm sorry john um <laughs> but yeah so i think just uh, because it wasn't all my vision but i was like i know how to make good tv for kids that's sort of how i went through it and then listening to everybody just listening and going oh wait i don't know what i'm doing maybe i should listen to this person Mm -hmm. that and putting your ego barfing it up and then putting in a drawer and just closing the door just close it don't ever open it back (laughs) yeah that ego no i mean it's good to check in on and be like are we okay we're okay okay Okay, that hurt, but it's fine. Um, doing that, I think, oh. has helped a lot. No, you're saying, oh, because you're like, I put my ego yeah. in a drawer a long time ago, too. <laughs> right? Too much drawer, I need to check. Yeah, yeah, check it, water it. Yep. So the development process was great. It was the fastest development process I've ever had. It was very supportive. Um, I got to to show run with training wheels on. So it was, yeah, it was a really good experience. That's okay. How long was the development process? So they, uh, you know, Kalila had developed the, sh- the theater show over years. And then, uh, I don't know, like it was like August of, wait, what year is it? It's 2023, right? It was August mm-hmm. of 2022. And we went into camera. We delivered by September. It was like a full year of a process from going from top to freaking tail, wow. which felt really fast. That's fast. That's really Isn't fast. It? That's really yeah. fast. That's yeah. so yeah. fast. So I didn't have time to be like, <laughs> any mm-hmm. at any moment like if i was like huh, I'd be like pick up your socks yeah mm-hmm. also feel what you gotta feel mm-hmm. yeah, yeah yeah but like also there was just like it was a freight train that i was like running beside and then you know those movies in oh the i 90s know those movies yeah. where someone's running yeah. every why are we always running beside a train just get to the station it's so on good. time the fugitive best <laughs> and then <laughs> jumping on right good movie but anyway so, so yeah. people in the 90s were always missing trains in movies <laughs> why can't you just go 10 minutes I early don't know. The train. i don't know it's plot point they were brazen yeah. enough to chase yeah. it I, like, that's what know. I mean. Like, My I'm God. Like, oh, train. I'd be like, <laughs> that one's gone. It's too fast. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. So, the development process was good. It was the fastest of development I've ever been in. Uh, yeah. And it was different because I was not the actual creator of the idea. So Got it. Yeah. Got it. Um, and I know we're not all singers other than Angelica, but if we could just keep our mic a bit closer. Sorry. Uh, I keep forgetting. No, no worries. Leah. No, we all, I think, have musical theater experience. I that's mean, the pathetic part. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. I think so. I <laughs> don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and Angelica, okay, so using Moonshine as an example, which is an incredible TV series, you can stream it on CBC Jam. Um, can you describe the journey of advancing from story editor to exec story editor to writing your very own episode, which is titled How to Lose Friends and Shit Can Your Reputation? Um, <laughs> and for those that don't know, can you kind of describe the roles a little bit? Shit <laughs> 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 yeah. So, um, I mean, Story editor and executive story editor, l- roughly kind of similar jobs, I would say. As a story editor, um, that was my like official title on Moonshine, but I was also coordinating at that time. Um, so I was coordinating and I wrote, um, I started off with a half script that got bumped up to a full script. 
uh, my first season with them, and so that was an awesome experience. But I was doing that while also coordinating, which <laughs> your <laughs> eyes <laughs> like <laughs> coordinating. Your I, I don't I, know, I know anyone who does like coordinating. <laughs> I know so you know what it means because <laughs> your face is like. No. Ah. Um, but yeah, so in st when I was a story editor, it was a lot of like. Um, it was combined with uh, coordinating duties, which was just like taking notes, uh, doing clearances. I was there throughout production, so I was there the whole time. Um, and doing, yeah, and like, I, our showrunner was really awesome because she really let us be part of the process. And so even as a story editor, I was like um, editing scenes for like, to you know, if they had to go out the next day. Um, she le would let me take a crack at it, um, you know, like smaller scenes, but, you know, she Great. would still let me do that. And then that was kind of more the same as an executive story editor. I would say the biggest difference was um, when I was a story editor, I, I was in production, but because I was coordinating, I wasn't really on set as much. But as an ESE, uh, executive story editor, I had time dedicated to be on set. That's cool. So that was really great. I got to be there for um, my block. Um, and so I got to be on set and produce um, a little bit. I had um, I had like a senior writer on set with me, um, but you know we kind of just worked together to produce, and that was that was a really great learning experience. So I feel like as you kind of go up, you get more responsibility um, producing. Oh, and also for new writers, it means a little bit more money. <laughs> The, what you want to do is you want to gain titles up to producing because then you can transition into show running because then they think, oh, you've been on set. You understand how to yeah do it from top to tail, right? Yeah. yeah. I will say it is rare. It's more rare now. <laughs> more rare yes. now to get like on set experience. Ask for the on set experience. Ask for the on set experience. If, I, I mean, obviously financially, if you can do it, because um, sometimes they can't, like they don't have the money to pay you. Um, if you can, like, ask a shadow even, like, Smart. just to get yourself in that. Also, make things. Like, mm. a lot of my friends make um, amazing projects, and, you know, they've they've learned so much producing um, through that, and, and it's, tr uh, you know, transferred to their writing, and, yeah. Definitely. And Angelica, your friends have been making amazing web series, trailer to web series, short films. Some of them are playing at the festival. So definitely if you can go out, make something. If you're in a writing room, ask for onset experience. Uh, Leah, for you specifically, how does your experience shadowing on sort of the TV series for multiple roles, how did that help you in the writing room? Um, did it help you in terms of pitching or breaking story ideas? Um. I don't. I don't know that it was s strictly related to that. I, I really wanted to shadow to observe directing pr in particular, um, but also because I was shadowing the showrunner, I was seeing all of that. So, I, so specifically for season one, I was really there from like, you know, the beginning of of the room all the way into prep, all the way into like all through production. I was there <laughs> so it was that was an amazing experience it was great to do it on uh you know a, a well-funded <laughs> television show and see how big that machine is so that that to me was invaluable and and being on set i think the way that it does relate to writing is you do need to see how the sausage is made uh which is why i asked for that on-set experience because you'll see how your scripts end up being handled in that context and where things can fall off or where, you know, th y you'll, see you'll even see the quality of your script. You'll see how well it was written based on how it's shooting, and then you'll see it in the cutting room. You'll see how well it, you know, it, it really does kind of all tie together. Uh, for me, like, shadowing was part of what I kind of always did. When you were talking about, like, our kind of background and experience, for me, I... I wanted to have jobs in every single department as much as I could. So my experience looks really strange. It's very, it looks scattered. Like I, <laughs> I, I look like very um, fanned out in terms of my, you know, my, my trajectory. But it was uh, deliberate because I wanted to know what it was like to work in art department. I wanted to know what it was like to uh, work in craft. I wanted to know what it was like to work in locations. I wanted to know what it was like to do all the, to work on in the production office, to be a production office PA, to be a, a, a production coordinator, uh, to be a production manager, to do all of this stuff. I, you know, to work in development and then, you know, working on that side of things, to work in casting, to work, like, I've honestly done a, l a lot of all of that. Don't you feel like you could 
walk into any job now and do it though Literally. because we've worked in tv and film i'm not joking it's like i'm like well you don't have to panic you could just like the the thi- the only thing that like i'm insecure about now and that i want to learn more about is camera so like i've never ac'd but like i love i want to know more just because i'm i'm a director and i want to be a little more fluent in terms of you know what i'm asking for oh you know what you should play uh we used to play this on uh, what lens is it? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. Lens. it's a really good one to play with yeah. if you're get you get to go behind the camera because you'll understand why a lens is being chosen for an emotional re- or a, an yeah. actual reason yeah. rather than being like I don't know what the fuck. 50 Absolutely, yeah. you know, like you get to be savvy about about you know um, d- a direction that's motivated and one that's unmotivated and how that complements or expands on the story. Um, it's it's so it's all invaluable. But for me, like for show running and, and writing specifically, which to me is kind of one and the same or what, yeah. what I want to do, I want to be able to write scripts that are uh, that make sense with the budget and I want to understand the budget. I want to understand where it makes sense to cut corners and where it doesn't. Um, I want to be able to get the emotional core of the show to reach the finish line. And that's very difficult it's not easy when you watch a show and you're, you're thinking it's kind of meh it's like honestly like the amount of work that still went into that and it's so difficult to make it be effective especially under budgetary constraints and, and you know low resources it's so hard so for me that's that was always the puzzle was like how much can I ask of people in good conscience? So uh, that's why I want to work in those departments. I want to know what an ask is to that department if it means mm-hmm. them spending all nighters and you know I want to know what I'm asking in terms of the human cost. So I want to be aware. Um, I don't want, uh, I want a healthy set. I don't think anyone has to be, you know, (laughs) like ruining their body and and necessarily like lacking the most amount of sleep all the time to do this job. Like I feel like there must be a way and there has to be a way and we have to find a way to make sets livable. French hours. We did French hours on French hours, yep. We when you <laughs> say French hours, it's eight to five or eight to six. It's because we had kids. Oh, there's no nap time in the Oh middle. gosh, like that's so. People. It's so <laughs> good. <laughs> you feel like you're g- going f- to the spa. I'm like, what is this? This is like unbelievably luxurious uh and it's crazy that we feel that way because like we've all been gaslit by the system yep uh but yeah so like to have that holistic experience get the shadow in they should pay you for a shadow um and see if they can also give you a, a, a credit for that um get get it get it like people That's i i encourage people to never do any free work refuse free internships i know that's not I'll never judge anyone to say yes or no to anything, but I feel like people should be paid. If there's any money to be thrown their way, give some money to be on set, to be there as an observer. Um, I, I, yes, yes. So all that to say, shadowing will help everything in terms of the technical side of writing or the show running side of writing, because you'll understand how it comes out the other end. I don't know that it, will help you know your story structure if that's your initial problem to begin <laughs> with you might want to do some some different things but yeah well i will say like seeing how things get made and like the writing on a fly because production concerns i will say that has like yeah improved my writing skills yeah i feel like the bi- i've had the biggest jumps and like i think the quality of my writing when i've produced stuff like when i've made my own stuff and when i've been on set mm. because then i've seen oh, that's why that scene doesn't work. Or, oh, that joke doesn't land. It's so experience. Yeah, it's experience. And yeah. then being able to, on the fly, then, like, make the, the necessary changes. And so then on the next thing that I'm on, it's like, oh, I already know, even as I'm writing it, I'm like, oh, that joke needs to be sharper because X, Y, and Z that I've already learned. Yeah, or understanding, like, if, if, say, you're somewhere the location totally fell through and you can't actually s- shoot any of that scene, Ooh, that's a good one. you need to be one of the writers. If you're the writer on set or you're the showrunner on set, you need to know what the purpose of that scene was. And if you don't have that purpose there, where else in your shooting schedule can you integrate it into the script <laughs> on something you're already going to shoot yep. so you don't lose the purpose of that? Because normally all scenes should have a purpose. So, you know, that you know it'll turn you into this whiz. And, um, yeah, it's, uh, again, it's a muscle. I, I don't understand, like, it's too bad productions are getting, uh, it's, like, rare that they bring writers on set because who, who's going to fix, like, it's it's very difficult. So, anyway, it'd be great to have more writers on set. Yes. On productions that don't have a writer on set, do you know how they deal with those issues 
of the, when they need same day rewriting. Yes, the day the well, if you're a writer director, guess what you're doing? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, the actors sometimes help. I mean, if the showrunner's there and you don't have a writer on set, that's how you who you would turn to normally. Okay. Um, but I will take any suggestions from anyone <laughs> always. Like yeah. I've gotten out of sticky situations by listening to people on set, being the person that has to do that. So, but yeah. that's a great skill as a showrunner to have your ears open, listen to everyone on set, hear their input, uh, and I'm sure it's gotten you out of some like maybe sticky situations. Oh yeah, not knowing lenses, not yeah. knowing this, not knowing that, and I think just like listening and being kind, like karmically comes back to you, <laughs> and it makes you a better human because again, you put that little ego in that drawer. <laughs> and keep it closed yeah. um we've definitely touched off. on this but i'd love to ask for all of you uh could you provide any insight into kind of the dynamic of a writer's room highlighting how it evolves uh throughout the roles as you progress from a writer's assistant to a staff writer and to eventually a showrunner like kara how has that kind of progression worked for your own career yeah i mean uh yeah i mean i started as a as a writer's assistant and like have kind of moved up so i, I guess i can speak to that um yeah as a writer's assistant uh i was i think i was just so like i need to do my job right <laughs> which is which is like you know to take notes and um and be helpful in any way i can be um but maybe not necessarily pitch as much um Every, everywhere that I've worked at, they've always welcomed pitches from the writer's assistant. That was never a problem. And so I felt really lucky by that. But I, I personally found it difficult to um, take notes uh, and keep track of all the things that are happening mm -hmm. and ideate at the same time. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, a, yeah. it's a lot. And especially, you know, like when you take notes, writers are talking so fast. And sometimes their ideas are like, they started with a really big idea. And, and, it, and it's like five minutes of talking. And then they get to the nugget of the idea. And so at that point in my career, it was really about listening and le actively listening, taking what people are saying, understanding its core. Um, and then as I've moved up, you know, once I got a, out of being a writer's assistant or like a coordinator, then I didn't have that um, other task to deal with. So you're free. So you're free. And so you're just, <laughs> you're, um, you know, your main job is to then pitch. And so that was then a new muscle I had to learn because that wasn't a muscle that was trained in the previous position, right? So having to learn, learning how to prepare for that, um, learning, like still actively listening, but now this time with the, the gears of like, okay, how can I yes end that? What is working there that we can keep uh, building on? Um, what's something that I know, pr like, you know, if you're thinking that far ahead production wise may not work. So what is an alt to that? How can I, you know, and you're talking comedy, right? Yeah. Because you're saying yes and as yeah. well. Because drama is definitely Yeah, but different. in drama also, like in when I've been in drama rooms, um, you know, it's always been super collaborative in my experience. Um, and the yes ending is still like very much part of that. Um, and so I feel like as I've kind of uh, moved at each station, um, I think, you know, new muscles are being trained. So um, after like, getting the hang of like the pitching and ideating all the time and just being an ideas machine. Then it was like, okay, being on set, um, what does that look like? What, what, it, what are the new muscles that I'm working at there now? And it's like nice. producing and it's like, okay, um, communication is a big one, right? Cause you have to communicate with your showrunner what's happening. You have to communicate with the other writers what's happening and you have to communicate with your director. And it's like, you don't have a lot of time. Um, and sometimes things happen, things happen on the fly. Uh, sometimes, you know when when you're watching the monitor and you're like man that doesn't look that doesn't look right you always have to say it <laughs> you know talk to whoever you need to talk to to take care of it but like that's also a new muscle for me because like you know as a writer's assistant that was not a thing I that I I was doing right and so at each station you kind of learn something new and you just kind of build on that mm -hmm. uh yeah my god I mean all, all of that, that. Was very well all of are you right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I can just kind of, you know, e echo your sentiments about, like, I, I, um, I, I kind of talked my way out of having to accord and write the episode in, on season two because I kind of, I knew, wha I did it in season one, I coordinated in season one, and I knew I wasn't going to be able to seize my opportunity as a writer properly if I had to coordinate at the same time. And that's personal to me. Some people are really great at juggling 
those things for me it was exactly that it's it's that hat of like you're essentially a filter for for words coming in and coming out your fingers and taking those notes and making sure you don't miss anything or you're ideating and i knew like season one i worked very 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 hard to still take uh you know diligent appropriate notes but pitch as much as i could because i knew i had the luxury of being in a room where it was really welcomed and i i you know god bless that like i i was so happy to be in a room where people kind of just treated me like an, another story editor. So it, it, I talked a lot and I, I love that. So I, you know, I knew how much that took out of me and I didn't want to do that in season two because I knew m the quality of my work would, would be poor for it. And that was my first network script. So I really wanted to put everything I had into it. Um, talk to people, negotiate, see what they're open to. Cause I mean, it, w it, it was a little nerve wracking for me to say like, could we not do that? And like, see if we can't find someone else or whatever. And that conversation was opened and you know, I'm the one who like brought in a few names and said like, here, I've got some people who might be great uh, chords. And uh, we had uh, the super talented Onyeka come on. And I mean, I'm so grateful that they were part of, of the room after that. So um, good things can happen if you're, if you're, um, you know, diplomatic and, and tactful and respectful about stating your needs and, and trying to, you know, work together. It doesn't always work out, but sometimes it does. Um, so I would say, like, uh, in terms of room dynamics, know who you're working with. And, you know, you can test, test the waters in terms of how far outside of the scope of your responsibilities you, you can go. Some are more open to things, some are not. And you kind of just have to go with the flow of that room. Uh, each showrunner has, you know, it's their prerogative to run the room in, in the way that they feel is the best for the creative. And those are going to be different ways, methods, and different personalities and different things. Like, for me, um, I hope that we will move towards systems, both in, in the rooms but in on set, that are um, less deeply hierarchical. There's, there's a hierarchy, so to speak. To me, it's just positions. We all have our different, you know, positions and on on set. To me, let's not talk about hierarchy anymore. It is like a a production assistant, an AD, a showrunner, a production designer. Like we all have ic vital roles on a set. The set will not function well if you pick these people, pluck them, pluck them out, you know. And uh, we need to make sure everyone just comes on as a full professional, <laughs> an adult who's there to work and, and participate in the making of this project. So maybe we can like change those dynamics to, you know, you're putting on like a, a managerial hat. You're like delegating tasks. You're not better than that person you're delegating to. They are professionals in their own right. So you function as someone who delegates and you do that appropriately and you treat everyone like, like an adult. And I'm hoping, yeah, rooms and, and sets can develop that dynamic because it's friendlier, it's nicer. There's no reason to ever get enraged on a set, uh, you know, unless someone's getting physically hurt or someone's being, you know, harassed. Um, we're not, you know, it's not life and death situations unless it's stunts, you know? Yep. <laughs> so like, yes. you know, if something is a bit late, if something is something like that, like there's no reason to yell at anyone. Uh, so let's be isn't you know. it funny because it just seems like normal people things like be nice like yeah like kindergarten yeah it's like it is the pressure i can like i can i can like it's human like i can humanize that you know some sometimes the pressure gets to you and it kind of brings out the worst mm -hmm. the worst that you can be and uh it's important to just like you know look in the mirror keep that in check and see what we can do to alleviate some of that response and like shift it into a more productive and like a more comfortable and safe environment for everyone to work in uh, while still like functioning at the height, at the height of our ability. Yeah. <laughs> Cranking out the good work, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think like giving people and yourself the grace to like make mistakes. Yes. And you know, and like be able to move past it. Like, you know, it's, it's, <laughs> It feels like such a big concept, but it, it <laughs> is like, I think once you kind of get in touch with that, it's like all these problems are just like, they're not as life and death. Well, and because everybody's doing their own part on a set, when you are that one one part and you screw up, this is something that I did during show running where I'd be like, it's, it's okay, we're solving it. 
and also to just try to be extremely nice and even tempered because a lot of people that I've worked with and for have not been that way necessarily and you are both 100% right you, we can be nice it, it's it's healing in our industry to do that so I think the more you can move forward with kindness in general mm-hmm. is the way to do it to change <laughs> to make changes but the hierarchy thing I fully agree I think in the writing room when you get in at first though you got to read the room I think yes. that's the thing because some people will crush you yeah. if you don't follow their rules properly and it's because they you know had to give their pound of flesh before so they feel like you need to do that too and so it's like it's, it's about diplomatically navigating your way through a yeah. white man's world. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you'll never change anyone, you know? So you got a, you signed a contract, you know you're here to stay, and if you've, like, you know, you you tried something and it went totally sideways, then move on. You're going to pivot and, you yes. know, do something else. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Like, I think also um, knowing your boundaries. <laughs> that, That's right. That's a big one. And, like, you know, if something's happening and you don't feel great about it, you got to say something. Um, don't let it don't let it fester don't let it you know be able to have those hard conversations and I know that they're really tough especially when you are the most junior person in the room yeah um, but you know you you're a person first and foremost and you know you have to this is something I learned which was like I have to take care of myself in these spaces because these spaces don't always take care of me yeah and so whatever that looks like for me I have to do that and so if that if that means having ha- having to have hard conversations um then I have to do that I mean you know there's many times where I, I I haven't done it myself but I know as I keep moving forward it's something that I it's another muscle I have to train yeah right I think just being brave to do that but then also if that doesn't work you got to figure out am I going to die on this hill yeah mm-hmm. mm-hmm. or am I going to accept this is this something I can accept mm-hmm. or do yeah. I need to e- keep escalating it because you yeah absolutely mm-hmm. and it and like th- sort of Democratizing democratizing a bit the notion of everyone's position to me doesn't mean everyone is going to talk equally. Mm-hmm. You know, I feel like y- there's there's a position and there's a usefulness and you have to kind of understand how the machine works and there comes a point where, you know, a- at a writers <laughs> table at the in the writers room if everybody is in there pitching hard, but some people weren't necessarily hired to pitch, someone was hired to take notes and that showrunner didn't necessarily want like an an equal amount of talking, it literally becomes airtime, you know, like in terms of getting everyone's ideas out in the room, you only have so many hours to work with. And as a showrunner, if you wanted the, these three voices very much because they had something to do with the story and you really wanted that input and the story chord was maybe you don't know their style, come come in as a story chord, like come in a little bit, pepper it, just let let your voice known a little bit and see how much it fits into this mix. The balance of the room. Yeah, you, you can know. share. I think yeah. that's what, I think some people that I've gone into rooms with, I'm like, oh, you weren't told to share your toys. Oh, you know, right. like it's just like sharing is a weird adult thing that we don't necessarily yeah. know how to do professionally because we're, you know gunning for each other's jobs when that's also a misnomer like there are there's a dry spell going on <laughs> but it doesn't mean that there can't be more jobs or because we're all creators like it's just a very yeah and it's like you know like ac- if you come from an acting background too it's like you know you'll show up at the same auditions with the same people all the time but you that, yeah, yeah I- if, if you're you know kind to yourself you you'll un- you know try to make yourself understand or already understand that you're not in competition necessarily mm-hmm. with these these people are not like enemies you know your colleagues they're your co-creators allies could be allies absolutely and you should be rooting for everybody to to succeed um so like for me when i come to i I watch a set i love an efficient set man like it's just like it is a pleasure it is like a semi-pornographic view for me to just watch things like go so smoothly and like people are just like on it what a great day we're having (laughs) like those things I live for I live for it so it's knowing also like if you're coming up to uh you know the director and you're a grip and you start to tell them like how they should shoot the scene 
it's maybe not understanding how that machine works. It's not necessarily that we want to shut you up and we don't want your ideas, but it's understanding that, okay, I'm a grip, but I w I, I'm a director also, and I would love to get some input. Maybe now is not the best time, but maybe there is another time and place that I can craft so that it's convenient and it's welcome, you know? So understanding where, you're, where, where you are, how the machine's working, and how you can work with it. Yeah, that's the thing I did when I was a writer's assistant, like, slash coordinator. I I knew I had a hard time, like, you know, when, when, when a flow was happening in the room, I, I had a hard time, like, jumping in. So what I would always do is, like, at the top of the morning, because people are, like, still settling in, I'd be like, oh, you know what? I had this thought last night, and I would just, like, <laughs> yeah. run through all my yeah. That's <laughs> sneaky, but cute. That's <laughs> cute and sneaky. <laughs> that's smart. Yeah, that's that's smart. smart. Yeah. Yeah. All my pitches, or or I just like have a oh man, yes, in the mirror first yes. and then in the room. Yeah, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, you know, I was just thinking. Uh, <laughs> That's a brilliant way to do it because uh, these people yeah. are warming up their, their brains. Yes, their brains, and then also because That's they're smart. warming up their brains, and it's top of the morning, people are fresh, yeah. right? And so they're less jaded I, by the afternoon yeah. when they get hungry. And so if yeah. you're trying to pitch this idea halfway through the day and they're working on something that they're trying to figure out, they might not be as open as the top of the day, right? Mm -hmm. When it's like anything goes, we're all very optimistic right now. I <laughs> um, love that. Yeah. Or even when top there's of the day. sometimes when there's lulls, um, I'd be like, hey, you know, I was just thinking, um, throwing it out there as an offer. Here's blah, 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 blah. And so find that hole. Yeah, find yeah. find yeah, find those pockets and it's like sometimes they go for it and you you take they take the time to explore it as a room. Uh, and sometimes they don't and you just you have to be okay with that. You have to be okay with you threw something out. Don't it was be, not Don't received, be precious. Yeah. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. You can keep you just keep doing. It's a numbers game at this point, right? Yeah. And Angelica, we actually did get a question from an audience member, and I would <gasps> love for you to answer it from your cool. experience. Cool. Uh, okay. Well, we got a few, so I'll be <laughs> sprinkling them in uh, to this. Uh, there's an audience? <laughs> yeah, there's an oh audience. No. There's a little <laughs> audience right now. Oh, John um, was just recording us. <laughs> um, okay. At, at any point, has pitching ever not been welcomed as a writer's assistant or as a coordinator? And how do you read the room? Oh, that's a really good question. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know that I've. I, nobody has ever told me, hey, that's not a welcome pitch. <laughs> uh, but I think um, <laughs> what I, w I, when I was a coordinator, I always like, the first day, I always just kind of like, I listened a lot more. And I just tried to get a feel for the room, right? Like, okay, who is talking a lot? Who is not talking as much? Um, when people are talking, are they, you know, uh, talking a lot and then they get to their nugget of idea? Or is it just like a straight up pitch? Um, and then I was like, okay, are there people here that I am on the same wave wavelength as? Because then I'm like, those people, okay, it might be if I attach my pitch, if, if I add my pitch to their pitch, then it might be a little bit more welcomed, right? Mm -hmm. And so you kind of have to feel the room in that sense. So it's about reading people, understanding the dynamics of the room, and a lot of that is just listening and paying attention. Um, and, yeah, and hopefully, you know, you, you find those pockets where you can um, – you can uh, pitch. Also, I will say, um, talking to the other writers, especially like at lunch or a break. I don't know how much that is now in like no Zoom rooms. Yeah, <laughs> Zoom rooms, but like I think talking to other writers and just them getting to know you also makes them more open to you and your pitches. And so sometimes another thing I did <laughs> was like at lunch, I would just be like, yeah, I was thinking blah 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 blah. Like and like I just like softly like pitch an idea. And then sometimes they'll be like, "Oh, Angelica had a really great idea at lunch. Like, do you want to share it?" And then and then I'll g and then I'll get the chance you to share it. You use people as springboards, yeah. kind of. Yeah. And I think the other thing is, I've been in a, I've been in rooms where people like to try to kill their i like push their idea until they have nothing left. Oh gosh. And I'm like, and that's that's one. So for newer writers, I would say. If it gets shot down once or twice, if you're if you're brave enough to say it twice, you gotta let it die and then figure out why it absolutely needs to be in the script. But it might not need to be. So not dying on hills mm -hmm. when you're a more junior writer, I think is key because it's not your show. Mm -hmm. yep. So the showrunner has to decide. The head writer has to decide. I made that mistake a couple times where I was like, I'm gonna fight the head writer, and then I was like, Who am I? Can <laughs> I just go to the bathroom and take a chill out here? But you get passionate. So reminding yourself and having that perspective and that distance from it 
means you might get hired for. Absolutely. <laughs> like, I 100% like echo what these are saying. Same deal. I would add, like, at the beginning, I straight up would ask the showrunner. Uh, if you're a cord or an assist, um, ask, I, I ask them great. before the room begins. Like, I, I tell, again, super clear, I'm a writer. Here's what I do. Uh, it, our pitch is, would Leia you be welcome? Shirt that says writer. Yeah. <laughs> Not just a coordinator. <laughs> Smart. Writer, director. Anyway, um, yeah, it's... <laughs> I think having that conversation just you'll get the same exactly the same response typically which will never be like hey, you're absolutely not welcome <laughs> but you'll get a sense from their response there might be a little reticence there to be like well yeah you know like p pitch like maybe if you find a, a space to you know like and you could you can tell at that point they're like okay so they they're open to my input but they really don't want disruption in the room so you know, trigger, you know, Angelica's plan to just listen, just take a few, like, hey, listen. Hey, like that chicken? So I was thinking about <laughs> that scene that we're having a hard time with. I'm obsessed with that tactic. <laughs> That's smart, because I'm not like, fuck you, Angelica. I'm like, well, I do like the chicken, and maybe that idea. Yeah. Huh. And sometimes I would, I would like, give uh, the showrunners just some ideas myself. Say uh, some problem didn't get solved during the day, that room, and then after the room, I'm cleaning up notes. I might send a little something to the showrunner with the notes and tell, like, I just had a bit of an idea here if you, you know. And I think that's a smart tactic just because also sometimes the room goes so fast that if you, I've also done this and heard other people be like, eh, not this idea. And it's like, well, then you better have one to back it up because otherwise you're not pitching well. Mm -hmm. um, so, but sometimes put your own flag or button in it so that you can come back to it. Mm -hmm. and, and that might be the way mm -hmm. if you're, a little bit nervous about talking in the room at first because that'll give you confidence too if they and also it'll give you a little feedback could be like yeah. they, they'll, they'll be like that idea no but that idea works yeah so feel it out <laughs> feel it out and uh since we're all people of color i have this question which is a little bit loaded but if you can answer that would be really appreciated um so many writers write from their personal experiences Marginalized writers, in particular, are often encouraged to divulge their deepest traumas to audiences. We uh. love doing that. Uh, but have you ever felt conflicted when writing from personal experiences? And how do you also make space for creativity and exploring new narratives, exploring fun in your writing and in your uh, series creation? Yeah, that's a that's a one. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's a doozy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I I have a project um, that I've been developing for a while that is about um, my family and like like my immigration experience. Cool. Um, and you know, it's development process was tricky because I, um, not that it, nobody pressured me to like talk about my traumas or whatever, but I think I had a hard time between like how much, like what's the line for me as a writer personally? Like mm -hmm. how much do what, how real can I be versus how like TV or whatever it's gonna be and like, that I just had to find with myself and like um you know I came to a point where it's like oh this is not a biography right like this is a creative piece and so we can give ourselves whatever story we want you know it doesn't have to be you know pound for pound like our trauma or whatever we can give ourselves this the story we wish we had or you know I think like for me like that was the line that I I had to find for myself um yeah yeah, I uh, I struggle with it a lot. I think because because what I write is is in the sort of fantastical, um, and it never seems to be what people <laughs> want from me. Uh, I've had you know some sort of ask like why why don't you write about being mixed race and you know why don't you like thank you thank you <laughs> that I will it's hard that's listen. why uh, but not only that I just to me I find it. Um, I do write about that. I just don't write it literally. I'm not a literal person in that way. I'm a very literal thinker. I won't get your innuendo. Um, but <laughs> when it comes to my writing, I everything I write is processing some part of me that needs to be processed, but it is never literal. It's going to be through some Weirdo lens. Space metaphor. Yeah. yeah. It's going to be in space. It's going to be on some castle in a fake medieval land. It's going to be somewhere, you know, kind of nuts. Um, and I I have seen my experience so far has really been, like, if my project is not literal, then no one sees it as an expression of who I am. And as being, as being like, a, a 
to me a kind of literal treatment of what I'm going through only through this this sort of you know this viewpoint. Um, people see a log line that says princess this or a log line that says space you know crew members on space like that sort of thing. So they don't see a log line that says. A uh, diverse person comes to terms with culture clash of, you know, those buzz wor those but words. But in space. <laughs> Brown people can yeah. go to space. That's not fair. Well, <laughs> uh, well, if you look at my shows, though, beyond the, y the log line and actually look at the show, like all of my shows are meant to be cast, like extremely <laughs> diverse. It's part of the DNA of it. It's part of the, the, the comment. It's part of what I'm saying. Um, but if it's not in the log line, I feel like it maybe won't fulfill a person's mandate to bring diverse stories. This is just a fantasy show. This is just this kind of show. I think Canadian executives have gotten smarter because I feel like now they understand a little bit more that the niche of what we're doing in Canada is niche. Like when we go niche, it's really great. Mm -hmm. I think like sort of is a great example of that, that it can still hit a broad audience, but be a really specific story. But also being uh, like I'm I'm mixed as well and I'm when people are like so what's your story I'm like I don't know do you want to tell me under explain me my trauma because it's really weird and specific and I wrote a very literal uh pilot about my family and I was like huh nobody really wants this I've seen my white writing partner do a great job of this of taking her trauma and making it a metaphor like, and it's funny because I'm like, oh, well, they always ask brown people to do it, but she's doing it too. So I, yeah, I feel like the really great thing to ask yourself is how can I take who I am, what my DNA is, put it into the story somehow, but also what do I want to see on TV? Yeah. Yeah. It's, and then make that, it definitely you know. is like a weird, it's a weird, like, I don't know, man. Like for, for me, I don't feel like it has served me, uh, financially or career-wise to kind of do what I do you know it uh, like again representation has not you know been an easy thing for me uh pitching has not been an easy thing because it like I struggle to find a logical place to pitch like producers who do what I write like I, I truly like the broadcast like where does where would this land I can't really see that in Canada so it's not for me it's not so much a stick to my guns it's just the only f way i feel to do it and it's that's all like if i was one of those writers and i wanted to be for many years one of those writers who could choose to just pivot and write something more marketable i would have many years ago uh i'm uh you know uh, <laughs> i don't have a lot of money <laughs> so um you know that would be great that would be awesome to just be able to like let's do the two write something super marketable and then keep like i only i only have this thing coming out of me and that's what that's what gets written that's what gets written down mm -hmm. Uh, caution <laughs> Ca buyer beware caution you know what I mean like make your own choices I'm happier this way uh, it doesn't make me happy to 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 try and write things that that I have no reason to write or inspiration to write or cause to write so I don't uh, and it is it isn't the money path so I'll say that but I do I do get a sense of wellness I think from it I do get a sense of happiness from from just creating the stuff I create and seeing where it could possibly go. So if you want to write trauma, do it. <laughs> or yeah. write whatever the hell or you write want. Or yeah, write whatever yeah. you want. And I feel like also your lens is going to be your lens, yeah. right? Like that's just baked into who you are and your voice as a writer. And so you, you know, you, you can, if you want to like be overt about it, but you also don't have to because it's, you know, your point of view as a storyteller is just so informed by your own life experiences that you really... You can write whatever you want, and it'll it'll be specific because it is you who wrote it, right? Yeah, I will say, even if this wasn't market, sorry, I like jumped in there. Um, like the the first recognitions I got in terms of selections to programs only happened when I really started writing what I wanted to write, and that was kind of the jump for me. The leap for me was I started getting these selections. So it it, it wasn't all bad, you know, to kind of choose that that path. I will say that. Sorry. Go ahead. No, no, I was just going to say, and to let other young writers know, I'm still figuring out what my stories are all the time, and then looking at them and being like, this is garbage, and then I go make a whole show for somebody else, you know, like, so don't, uh, 
if it's hard to find what your lens is, it's okay. Because I feel like I'm still doing that, and I feel like I'm old now, but it's <laughs> not. It's still not hitting. I don't know what, you know, no, I'm teasing. But, like, uh, it's, a, it's a cool career. Career. Um, it's a cool career <laughs> to develop yourself as a human being over a long period of time and not going, oh, I have to hit this milestone here mm-hmm. or this, because you realize as a writer you're always going to be improving. 100%. Hopefully. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and your lens changes, too, as you grow, right? Like, as you have more experiences in life, in career, and whatever, your lens does change. And so that's forever. You're forever, like, working on that. What are all of your favorite ways to develop your writing, to develop your voice, whether you're working on your own personal projects or for uh, writing on someone else's uh, project? Ooh. Do you have any exercises you do at home? Are you journalers? I, I do journal. <laughs> I do journal. You do journal. Oh, I do journal. I'm a journaler, journaler too. Yeah. I, but I don't journal every day. I journal when like I have really big like life moments or like moments where I'm like, oh, I feel like I need to check in with myself. Um, yeah, I journal a lot. I think I check in with myself a lot. I, I, you know, I I watch a lot of TV. Um, I read, not as much as I want to, but I do. Um, I think just and also just meeting people, talking to new people, like. Mm-hmm. I think that is such a big part of like finding your voice and finding what um, you know what interests you, what uh, what points of view um, you know you you can speak on, or you feel like you're you're like wow, that's how I feel about that topic. Like I think stuff like that is important. Having hard conversations with people. Mm-hmm. Every cr- like sculpting watercolor walking <laughs> anything that's not writing yes mm-hmm. is a great thing to yes. do other than writing regularly right yeah. like ke- uh, trying to keep some of that because it is a muscle and it go i've taken some months off it's gotten real flabby let me tell you uh <laughs> but i think just doing other things to feed your human soul helps yeah like 100 talking to people mm. getting outside your own head yeah yeah I I am a ponderer. I I like to I will I will look pretty bananas because it's pretty much sitting still in a chair and then occasionally going like <laughs> and then like <laughs> I'm just slowly putting the pieces together complete complete stillness just like so it's a very boring process. I don't look like I'm doing anything. Um but it's it's me falling down a rabbit hole in my mind and it will light me up to just see like what is here like and I, I'm I'm kind of like in a in a room and then I'm I find out it's not a room it's an apartment and it's a house and I'm like okay okay and I'm just a- after I go through that process then I will start writing some cards down and I'll start being like this is a scene this is a moment this is something I really want to look at this is you know and then I start thinking this is for example like how I can put this how I can put this into like a, a coherent engaging you know forward moving story what can i get out of that um and sometimes a lot of that begins with me listening to music mm-hmm. walking listening to music i do a lot of walking and listening to music if you see me in the street i won't say hi to you yeah <laughs> move just move get the get the you know fluids going get the blood pumping Ooh, that's another thing um i read recently that an hour of sweating a day i was like i do not an do hour? that an like hour you know, women on tiktok no, no, it's no, not it's your walk listen, nine minutes. listen but what it is it's a <laughs> bubble bath for your brain apparently so being active actually yes, i mean uh, truly. i can't do what these women on tiktok do an hour of me <laughs> i don't have time for that crap but but the idea somehow yeah like sweating like physically because uh, when you're up here it, you can get stuck here and sometimes mm-hmm. the answer is in your body yeah. yeah i will also say something i like to do is to just listen to people <laughs> like so in a cafe or something love yes. eavesdropping love observing it's amazing though. um and i think you know you just yeah hearing how people talk is like a really big one i remember i was like on a bus and there was like a group of teenagers and i was just they were so funny. Um, they had, they were, one of them wanted to borrow money from the other, and then he was like, yeah, I'll pay you back. I'm going to get a job. I have to do the interview first. But <laughs> in, like, two weeks, I'll, <laughs> I'll have it for you. First, I get the job. <laughs> I know. And I was like, and I remember just dying of laughter <laughs> in my seat because only, like, only, uh, like, a teenager, like, a 15-year-old would say that because they, like, they've never, ha- they ha- haven't had a job before, right? And so just, like, listening to people is just, awesome it's the best it truly is teenagers as well if you're writing for ya you're like 
I, I always turn around and I'm like, tell me everything. Oh, yeah. Are you guys dating? What do you do? Do you yes. take your lunch at the lockers? What do you, is that cool? No? Like, Very cool. on the bus, yeah. it's like that, that your bud comes out very yes. like, hmm. <laughs> So a good idea is getting outside of yourself, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. not just. Yeah. I'm the only one who, like, isolates right now. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just like, bloop. But there's collaboration, though. I got to say, that's just for me in the beginning. Mm -hmm. After that, you write your script. Like, it can't end there. It has to be shown to a billion people or whatever. Like, your, ch your chosen few. Your chosen few. And, like, get that input um it will only go so far if you keep it to yourself and i i oh there's some young writers that you know i'll talk to and they're they're new at it and they're so protective of it it's very very hard to show it very hard to put it out there but do it do it do it do i it. gave a talk at tmu the other day and someone was like i'm i'm a little embarrassed i was like do you guys make things like what do you do i'm embarrassingly i make watercolor bookmarks okay like a grandmother oh, but it's really so nice. meditative and fun right i would like one this woman okay no problem um but like i was, I was like oh okay tell me what you're doing she's like i'm a little embarrassed i just did like some 3d renderings and it but and i was like okay. i'm sorry embarrassed by what your <laughs> immense skill and talent uh <laughs> so yes young young writers young creators out there share get over the embarrassment part mm -hmm. because what the thing is is with i think younger children is that they live in a culture of judgment and some of us didn't necessarily grow up in that same so i'm like yeah. you have shame because <laughs> you grow up on the internet you know it's anyway yeah we had yeah. a lot less of it right you 15 kids in your class and that's it right you're like, yeah. I care about five of you. They're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. And I'm moving class. schools. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> Mom, Dad, I can't go to school anymore, essentially. I myself in front of ten people. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, we're coming close to an end, so I do want to leave on this. What are What's a dream project for you? What's next? What are you working on currently? Um, and what hope do you have for the industry, for any newcomers? Big one. Okay. <laughs> Angelica? <laughs> You want me to you go first? Cara? You, wanna, you want me to go first? Yeah. I just called you out. That's bossy <laughs> of me. I'm like, you do it. Uh, dream project. My writing partner and I have acquired IP of a novel that's a sci-fi so set cool. in the Rockies. Uh, so that's the dream project that feels like it's be inching towards more reality. We got CMF early development funding mm -hmm. last Woo. year. Yeah, it's always oh, opening that envelope, eh? Mm -hmm. Money. It's $2, just kidding. But <laughs> uh, no, 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 it's more than that. But still, it feels like it sometimes. Um, but that, and, and as well as any retrofuturism projects, and the reason I love retrofuturism, which is the idea of like, what did they think the future was going to be like in the 60s? Um, it's very, it's... <laughs> It's Armageddon, but with hope. Uh, so <laughs> those are the projects that I kind of like to do. And comedy, like, I want to do all the projects. Never mind. And w a project with music. Yeah. That's what oh, I'd love I to love do that. next. Because I had, like, Auntie B's, like, I try yep. to do music everywhere I go as well. But, yeah. That's it. I apparently have a bunch of dream projects. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see what gets made. Uh, yeah, I think, yeah. Uh, same. I have a few on the docket that, that would be terrific. But I'm... Uh, starting to develop my first feature script, so uh, that's a new, it's a new format for me. But uh, lightning kind of struck, and now I have something in my brain that must come out. Awesome. <laughs> um, so that that is intended to uh, be a directorial debut at some point. So hopefully that comes out pretty well. Who knows? Um, but I'm really really jazzed about that. I uh, would love to direct more. I think like right now I'm so jazzed to direct. Uh, I I love writing i'm you know i think adjacent to directing and this sort of feature like if i had my dream of dreams like making one of these shows that i've been working on and finally getting a chance to try and execute what tho those visions are that i think have been kind of a hurdle to to get through um and uh yeah i think like that th those things would make me incredibly happy to get at that point where i can execute some of my uh, my ideas and make them make them real and also i want to be in a band so like i want to be in a you band like a girl group? let's do it let's do it yeah any band i just want to i'll sing oohs and ahs in the back i'll be at the front row okay thank you that's um oh well i i have a couple things that i'm working on that i'm really excited about but i guess like okay there's levels to this dream okay yeah. okay so dream of so dreams okay yeah. i really dream of dreams i really want to make a show set in the philippines 
Um, and I have this whole idea about this house. Anyways, it's like it's shot there. Like shot yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. So shot beautiful there too. And like about like this ancestral house. And it's like about this family over the course of like several generations. Ugh. It's like my dream of dreams. I'm in. Should connect after about this idea. Let's do it. Let's do it. Story uh, so that's a dream of dreams. But like dream of like in next year slash in the near future i just keep telling people this all the time now which is like i want to make something um, so i really want to make like i want to make like a web series i want to like produce it i want to like i want to get that part of um the experience because it's you know we've talked earlier it's just hard to get on a show um the depth of which i want like i i want to be there making you know making those calls like creatively and like just writing um like the span of a season um so yeah that's that's the next dream Love it. um and then hope for um future screenwriters i guess is like oh yeah i forgot about yeah, that yeah that's part. the last part right we'll, yeah, we'll, 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 back. We'll, yeah. We'll, yeah. we'll go back we'll, we'll circle back um my hope is that um it's easier for them you know that i think uh that there's enough jobs uh, to sustain a career uh, for everybody from all walks of life to get a shot at like, you know, if this is what they want to do, that they can do it. Mm-hmm. Um, that we're, you know, kinder <laughs> to each other. Um, yeah, I think that's like the the big one. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I want to basically be like somebody's like, uh, you know, there's like Nepo babies. I want to be like the aunt to like <laughs> those never maybe even just like open the door <laughs> and just like stand there and be like what a come beautiful on in. wish come on for in. other people. <laughs> You the nepo auntie. Nepo auntie. No, I literally, I, I tell anybody I know that's like a like a coordinating. It's like here's everything I know. <laughs> tell me if you have any questions. It's like, and you know, there's a whole community of us, right? That are like um uh coordinators are you know who get it right who've like gone gone through the grind Mm -hmm. um and so yeah i think yeah just you know making it easier for everybody else they're great hopes they're great hopes uh and i'm not sure what i can tag on top of that but maybe uh (sighs) i don't know i i hope (laughs) i hope it gets more and more accessible to to make stuff on your own um Mm -hmm. as it has been and maybe it'll keep going that way it's mm-hmm. still very prohibitive and still a huge barrier i think um it's it's advice that kind of irks me a bit when i hear like do your own stuff because it is like absolute privilege to have money and time to invest to make your own stuff so i hope it gets more and more accessible and technology gets more and more accessible um yeah i i, I think that would be great to just stay creative like do it because you love it and stop if you don't love it um s- be be honest with yourself and uh um, it's hard to pivot w- sometimes when your identity gets tied into being a writer, being, you know, that whatever it is that you strove so hard to, to do, um, it's okay to pivot, and sometimes it leads to things you would never imagine. So I think my hope is to just, you know, keep keep doing what makes you happy and fulfills you. It's not necessarily easy. It won't necessarily always be fun, but if it keeps fulfilling you, keep doing it, and if it doesn't, it's totally cool to, like, do something else. <laughs> You're not a quitter. You're not You're a quitter. Just pivoting. You're a smart person. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'd wish for French hours again. I can't say it enough. So just a shorter work day for everybody so we can all have a life. Yes. And this is the advice, though, that I have to give every young writer or director that I come across. I'm like, you have to make your own stuff so that you can get the opportunity to make things for money. And that, you're yeah. right, it is kind of sucky. Yeah. But even if it turns out like crap, this is the other thing. <laughs> you just got to put it out there. So I wish for young filmmakers and writers, et cetera, to be brave. To have that bravery and to just say, screw it, I'm going to put it out there. And if it doesn't work, one corner of the internet can judge me and I'll figure it out. You know, because I think that's the way to do it. Make your own opportunities. It, I, yeah. ha- I hate it too, but it's like yeah. the realist and it's how I learned a bunch of things too, mm-hmm. right? Absolutely. And there's so many ways around it too, like finding your community, finding friends, w- pooling resources together, yeah. right? And 48 hour film challenges. 48 right? hour yeah. film challenges. Yeah. yeah, like, you know, it doesn't have to be, I think sometimes when we say, oh, go out and make stuff, there's this idea of like, oh, it has to be like perfect and like ready to go to a festival. And it's like, it doesn't have to be like, yeah, not your first one friend. Yeah. Not your first (laughs) one. Like sometimes it's just like, you just have to make it. You just have to test the waters, 
see what works what's not working and then you keep doing it and it, you know hopefully yeah. you know as you get more access to funding um you know you get to make stuff at a higher level absolutely and i think like no one should forget about the impact it is that people see you making things yes. if people just see you making things mm -hmm. Even if all you do is, is take your iPhone and go out and shoot things and you go from that process of writing, shooting, editing, and you've done it 10 times over on small three minute movies on your iPhone and you're posting those, it doesn't matter that they're not incredible. No one is expecting that, but that people see your dedication, your interest, your passion, your consistency, like your will to just push and learn and do things to learn. Those are learning exercises that really sticks with me. And I think it sticks with a lot of people who watch you doing it. So don't, yeah, it's not all about the, the, the project. Like don't be a perfectionist in any portion of your life. I <laughs> like, think, no, I think help. in this industry, people appreciate the people who do. Yeah. And just by meeting younger people that do things or follow up or keep in touch, I'm like, oh, I'm going to think about you next time because I know you have the wherewithal and you're not going to crumble on set. No. <laughs> 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 no, nobody okay, crumbles yeah, on no, no crumbles. Well, I'll use this laughter to kind of fade us away. Uh, Kara, I really want to see the dozens of projects that you'll be working on that's in your head. Leia, I need to see your feature film. Angelica, I will come to the Philippines to help you make yes. this TV series. Yes, we all will. Uh, thank you so much for all of you. It's been great to be able to take your brain. Thank you for answers. the thoughtful questions. No, it's no, truly no lovely. problem. I love putting uh, this, this together and researching all of this. It's been so amazing watching all of your series and getting to just speak with you all. Um, I want to say thank you so much for the audience. We have more industry programming. Tomorrow we have CBC's Popstar. We'll be watching the first three episodes. Yeah. And we'll have a discussion. Uh, it's a totally free event. On Sunday we have our uh, short film pitch competition. Angelica was a mentor two years ago. So for everything we've been talking about, if you want to see younger filmmakers here in Canada pitching short film ideas, making them, this is a great place to come and see how they are doing that mm -hmm. and how they're using resources to make short films that potentially can play at film festivals like this one or Inside Out or Imaginative um, or some of the other fantastic festivals we have here. Uh, and lastly, uh, we'd love to hear your feedback. Uh, we have a survey that we'll post, um, we'll put on the you know QR code on the screen. If you can please let us know your thoughts, we appreciate that. Thank you so much to you three. And we hope to see you around for the rest of the festival. Thank you.